until to, until yesterday, I was convinced I had no connection at all with uh, uh, Irving Adler. But I checked in the library of the institute if I could find some of these 55 books. I'm sorry to tell you that none of them is in the library. <laughs> but uh, I could, uh, if you disconnect the camera for one second, I could download one of them <laughs> illegally. Uh, the, the magic of numbers, something like that. And immediately looking at this book, I understood that I knew this book because I read it when I was a kid. Of course in French, but I learned from this book what is the Möbius band. And I also learned something that I never forgot and I want to teach you now because it's really wonderful. How to multiply numbers with your fingers. Do you know this trick? You want to multiply 7 by 8. So you say se eight, 7 is one hand plus two fingers. 8 is one hand plus three fingers. You count how many fingers are lifted. 5. And you multiply the number of, di of, of fingers which are folded. 3 times 2, 6. 56. So you can multiply numbers if you only know how to multiply until five with your, with your hands. And I learned that in this book when I was a kid. And as an exercise for you, but this is not the topic of my talk. How would it be if we had 12 fingers? <laughs> prove or disprove that this is still true. Okay, so uh, Really, uh, 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 Irving Adler had some influence on me. It's, it's amazing to see when you open a book that you haven't opened in the last 40 years, that what impresses you is not the text, it's the pictures, for me at least. I didn't forget the pictures. I forgot the text, of course. Okay, so today what I want to do is to somehow um, explain the work of one of my students, but it will take some time. So I want to start by the beginning, and basically I want to discuss the behavior, the dynamics of geodesics on surfaces. So the fundamental paper on this topic is by Adamar in 18... It's a wonderful paper in which he wants to understand the behavior of uh, a geodesic on a negatively curved surface. I will not explain the full paper, I'll just give one example. Suppose you have a surface like that, which is bounded by three closed geodesics, in which has negative curvature. And suppose you want to understand the behavior of a geodesic which is traveling in this surface. So the trick of Adamar is this. You cut on this pair of pants three intervals. One is here, perpendicular to these two geodesics. One is here, and one is here. And you give three names, like A, B, and C. If you take a geodesic, and if you assume this geodesic stays forever, in this surface, it will cut and determine a sequence of letters A, B, C, B, A, C, B, A, C, etc., etc., with only one obvious rule that after an A, you do not have another A, after a B, you do not have another B, after a C, you have, do not have another C. And the theorem of Adama is really wonderful. It tells you that given the sequence, any sequence, by infinite sequence, in the future and the past, there is one and only one geodesic following this combinatorical pattern. So you can encode the dynamics of the geodesics on this surface by just sequence of letters. I should add, because it's true, but also because his portrait is on the other side of this wall, that this has been much better understood by Morse in the 20s. As a corollary, which is not obvious at all, 
everything is independent on the choice of metric that you make on the surface. If you take two metrics with negative curvature on the same pair of pants, and there are plenty of them, for each geodesic of the first one, you can associate a unique geodesic of the second one, and conversely. In particular, the dynamics of the geodesic flows on a surface of negative curvature is independent on the choice of this metric on the surface. This is a fundamental theorem that, to, be a, to, to tell the truth, Adama did not state, Morse did not state, but Gromov proved it. OK, so the theorem, let me, Gromov proved it in an unpublished paper in the 80s. The theorem is this. If you take a manifold and two Riemannian metrics on it with negative curvature, If you look at the unit tangent bundles, unit tangent bundles of the first metric and of the second metric, you have the geodesic flow on the first one, the geodesic flow on the second one, and the theorem is that these two geodesic flows are conjugate by a homeomorphism. So qualitatively, the two geodesic flows are the same. This is a fundamental observation of, uh, of these people. OK. In uh, 1962, Anosov wanted to understand this picture better. He wanted to understand how it's possible that the negativity of the curvature implies this rigidity this structural stability, to use the modern terminology, the structural stability of the geodesics in negative curvature. And he introduced a concept that we call now Anosov flows, that I will only describe in dimension three. It's the following thing. You have a three-manifold, let's say compact three-manifold, And you have a flow on it, a smooth flow on it. You say that this flow is Anosov if you denote by x the vector field associated to this flow. If it's possible to construct two line bundles in the tangent bundle of the manifold, one being called the stable bundle, the other one being called the unstable bundle, with the property that when you flow an, along phi t, these bundles are invariant by the differential of the flow. The vectors tangent to ES are contracted, and the vectors tangent to EU are expanded. That's definition. A flow is an Anosov if it's expanding and contracting. And so Anosov proved two things. One. The geodesic flow in negative curvature is like that. And second, that the geodesic that Anosov flows are structurally stable. These flows are stable. What does that mean? <coughs> that means that if you take another flow, x prime, which is close enough to x, some other vector field which is close enough to x in the C1 topology, you have two flows now, phi t and phi t prime. The theorem of Anosov is that if the flows are close, then they are conjugate by homeomorphism. So there is a homeomorphism mapping orbits to orbits. In particular, this applies to the geodesic flow in negative curvature. So this Anosov definition captures what was needed to have the stability of the flow. So that was 62. Then there was a natural question. 
Can we understand these flows? <coughs> Can we find a list of them? Is there a possibility to give a classification of them? If you look in the book of, uh, of Anosov, you see only two families of examples. Example one is um, geodesic flows. on surfaces of negative curvature. Surfaces or orbifolds, whatever. And example two is that one calls suspensions. Suspension is this. You choose a matrix in SL2Z. And you assume that its trace is bigger than 2. This implies that the eigenvalues of this matrix are in modulus different from 1. So this matrix has a linear operator acting on R2, has one eigenvalue smaller than 1, and one bigger than 1. So if you look at the action of this matrix on the two torus, R2 mod Z2 into itself. It is a diffeomorphism of the two torus, and this diffeomorphism is contracting in one direction and expanding in some other direction. So it is, it is an example of an Anosov diffeomorphism. If you want to make a flow out of this, use the standard construction, which is this. You take the product of R2 mod Z2 cross 0, 1, and you identify the two boundary components. So x0 will be identified with a of x1, where a is the linear transformation. If you do that, you produce a three-manifold, which obviously fibers over the circle with fiber a torus. And you have a canonical flow on it, which is the horizontal flow. And when you come back to the torus, you apply the matrix. So this is an example of an Anosov diffeomorphism flow. And if you look in the book of Anosov, as I told you, you only have these two examples. When I was a student, my dream was to show that these are the only examples. And I worked hard, unsuccessfully. So uh, 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 some people could prove some weak results. Like, for example, if you take an analysis of flow and on a three-manifold, and if you assume that the fundamental group of the three-manifold is solvable, like here, then you can show, indeed, it is made like that. Or I proved that if you have a three-manifold, and if you assume that the three-manifold is a circle bundle, just like for the unit tangent bundle, then you can show that the flow has to be the geodesic flow. So that was optimistic. Putting some additional conditions on the topology of the manifold, you could get complete information on the, uh, on the dynamical system. And then came Thurston. Thurston came and constructed hundreds and thousands and millions and zillions of examples. Um, many different manifolds. For example, he constructed examples of another flows on hyperbolic three-manifolds. Hyperbolic three-manifold is the opposite of these of this families of, of examples. So the situation was really terrible. It was impossible to see, to dream of any possible classification. The world of another flows looked huge. So what I want to do today is somehow to restore hope. I want to give a, a conjecture that I'm going to state now in a very weak way. And the conjecture is, so let me put it in quotes, because the rest of the talk will be explaining the meaning of the conjecture. Uh, the conjecture is, there is only one another flow. <laughs> uh, 
up to, and this is what I have to explain. So my goal now is to introduce some reasonable equivalence relation in the world of another flows with the purpose of proving maybe, but this is only one example. Okay, so before I, I, I go to the definition here, let me uh, introduce the main character of this talk, Birkhoff sections. This is a very interesting uh, construction which has been uh, 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 produced by Birkhoff in 1917. Here's the construction. You want to understand, say, geodesics on the surface of genus 2. Then Birkhoff had a very clever idea. So let me draw a picture. So this is the surface of genus 2. with negative curvature. And on this surface of genus 2, I will draw six geodesics. Here's the first one. Here's the second one. Third. Fourth. Fifth. And wh where's the sixth? All around. Eh? Six is different. Actually, I drew 12 geodesics because each one of these six can be oriented in two different possibilities. Now, suppose you cut the surface of genus 2 along these six geodesics. What do you get? Well, you get four hexagons. Like that. You have one hexagon behind the blackboard and above, one behind and below, one in front above, and one in front uh, below. Okay, so you have these four hexagons. Uh, you can color them, say, black and white, like in a uh, uh, checkerboard. So suppose that this one is black, this one is white, black white. Among these four hexagons, I select only two of them, the two black ones. So I have two hexagons. Now, I fill these hexagons by concentric convex curves. Right, this look concave, but this is con convex because this is hyperbolic geometry. So you do that. Okay. Okay, so I have my surface of genus 2, two hexagons on it, and on each hexagon, these families of curves. Now I consider the set, let me call it S, in unit tangent bundle of the surface sigma, which consists of the set of all unit tangent vectors to one of these circles. I drew on my surface many circles or curves. On each curve, I have two unit tangent vectors. I consider in unit tangent bundle the set of all those unit tangent vectors which are tangent to one of these curves. This is clearly a two-dimensional object because over each point here, I have two choices. And now let me call, look at the closure of this set. Now let me 
claim something and try to explain for you. The claim is this S bar is a torus minus 12 holes. So claim. Claim is this S bar is homeomorphic to a torus minus twelve holes, twelve disks. First of all, you should be convinced that indeed they are not the twelve. One more. One more. First of all, you should be convinced that this surface indeed has 12 boundary components. Of course, the 12 periodic orbits I started with. Are you convinced that this is indeed a surface, a smooth surface? Yes? Maybe I should draw one or two pictures to convince you better. Uh, of course, the problem would be above this central point. What's happening here? But here you see just the standard blowing up. You have the standard picture. So let me draw the picture in unit tangent bundle. So this is the circle tangent to the center of my hexagon. And the picture is really like that. You know, the standard blowing up of a point in the plane. So obviously, this is a surface. And maybe you may be worried about what's happening in the corners. Do you worry? You do. OK. <laughs> so let me draw the picture. What's happening in the corner? In the corner, you see two geodesics which are crossing. I have four domains, and two of them are selected. So in unit tangent bundle, what I really see is four geodesics, two in one direction. This is the picture I see. So I drew the, this vertical line is the unit circle tangent to the corner. These two lines are the two geodesics. And these two lines are the two other geodesics. And now what's happening for my surface S bar? Well, it's like that. You see that in the, I made a mistake. What? You see that my two hexagons, when you lift them to universal cover, in the neighborhood of the corner, they are just glued along an interval. So really, you get a smooth surface with boundary. Now, why do you get a torus? Well, there are several possibilities. If you are lazy, and I will be lazy, you just count the Euler characteristics. You could how many faces, how many intervals. I mean, you could do computation, and you find minus 12. So it has to be a torus minus 12 disks. If you are not lazy, you just look at it until you understand the picture yourself, and you see a torus. But I cannot convince you. You have to convince yourself. This is a torus. OK, so what can you do with that? 
Well, this torus minus 12 holes is embedded in unit tangent bundle. of the surface. And the good point and the important point that Birkhoff makes is that this surface sitting inside this 3-manifold is transversal to the vector field. Transversal to the vector field everywhere except on the boundary. The boundary consists of 12 periodic orbits, so it cannot be transversal there, but everywhere else it is transversal. Consequence, if you want to understand the dynamics of the Jadzik flow, it is enough to understand the first return map, let's say capital F, from this torus minus 12 holes to itself. If you want to understand it, one way would be to collapse these 12 disks to a point, and you get a homeomorphism F bar of the torus to itself. And guess what you get? A matrix. You get a 2 by 2 matrix. And this 2 by 2 matrix, believe me, I made the computation several years ago, is the matrix 7, 6, 8, 7. So the summary is something I think really fantastic. Understanding the dynamics of geodesics on a surface of genus 2 is just the same thing as understanding the iterates of this matrix, 2 by 2 matrix. It's something really fantastic because, you know, matrix, this seems easier to understand. But in the case of, the, uh, 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 of genus 2, you have that. Of course, you can do that in any genus G, and the matrix you get in genus G is uh, 2G squared minus 1, 2G squared minus 2G, 2G squared plus 2G, and 2G squared minus 1. This is the matrix corresponding to genus G. No? Determinant is 1. You can check it. <laughs> OK? OK, so summary of this uh, short story. The summary is that if you want to understand the geodesic flow and surfaces of some genus, you are reduced to understand the iterates of some matrix. And somehow, if you understand the matrix, you understand the geodesic flow. If you understand the geodesic flow, you understand the matrix. This is the same problem. So let me uh, uh, introduce a definition. And then, at last, I can fill up the three dots and make a precise conjecture. Let me say that definition So for example, if you ask me, uh, if I ask you how many fixed points this 2 by 2 matrix has on the torus T2? Twelve. How do you compute the number of fixed points of a 2 by 2 matrix? It's the determinant of A minus identity. So if you take A minus identity, you get 6, 6, 8, 6. The determinant is 12. OK? It's OK. OK, so here's the definition. Suppose you have two flows, phi t on a manifold M and psi t on a manifold N. Three manifolds. I want to introduce some re equivalence relation, which would be such that it would not impose the three manifolds to be homeomorphic. So here's the definition. I say that these flows are almost conjugate. If one, finds, one can find a finite collection of periodic orbits for the first one, periodic for phi t, 
a finite collection of periodic orbits, delta 1, delta n, or psi t, such that if you delete these periodic orbits from m and n, the flows are conjugate. The flows are conjugate outside a finite collection of periodic orbits. And there is a homeomorphism from n minus this finite collection of periodic orbits to n minus this finite periodic collection of periodic orbits, sending, sending orbits of phi t to orbits of psi t. So I say that two flows are almost conjugate if, after deleting a finite collection of periodic orbits on both sides, what's left is conjugate. OK? Now my conjecture is this. It's only one and also flow up to this equivalence relation. To make it uh, correct, I should add a word which is not important, but I put it here, uh, transitive. Forget it if you don't know what it means. So this uh, uh, is uh, still open, as a maybe conjecture. There is a special case which is known and that I want to describe for you. Actually, I want to weaken my conjecture a little bit. And I want to replace this condition, this definition of almost conjugacy. This is ugly terminology, but may, let me say that it's virtually almost conjugate. This is ugly. If you have the same thing up to finite cover. So two flows will be called virtually almost conjugate. If you can find a finite number of periodic orbits where here, finite number here, finite covers of the complements and conjugates. If you do that, you're happy. And this is the OK, so what I want to state now uh, uh, is a theorem theorem of Pierre de Renoir, it says the following. All known and also flows are like that. All known and also flows are virtually almost conjugate. All known means, for example, all two by two matrices. Already, this is something interesting. If you give me two matrices in SL2Z, both of them having trace bigger than two, This provides two flows. And you can ask yourself, are these flows almost conjugate? The answer is yes, by my student. But how can you prove that? 
you could say, well, maybe they are already virtually conjugate by some finite cover. But the answer is no, because when you take a finite cover of such a matrix, you replace the matrix by a power of it, or, and you do not change this, the quadratic field which is there. The field generated by the eigenvalue is a quadratic field, and you do not change that. So uh, uh, taking finite covers without deleting periodic orbits, you will not kill the, the arithmetic of the, of the, of the two by two matrix. So really, if you want to prove that, you do have to delete some subtle collection of periodic orbits. And this is what uh, 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 Pierre de Renoir did. Uh, maybe I should write his first name completely, because his father is a mathematician with the same initial. So his father is Patrick, and he's Pierre. I want to, I will not prove it, but this is a very uh, interesting uh, uh, mixture of geometry, topology, and even number theory, because you're really dealing with conjugacy classes in SL2Z, which is something very venerable in number theory. So uh, I want to show you one or two pictures. Here's one. Example. Suppose you start with the gamma two, three, seven, the most beautiful Fuchsian group, the group generated by by the symmetries of a triangle hyperbolic space with angle pi over 2, pi over 7, and pi over 3. As you know, this generates a very nice tessellation of the Poincaré disk. The corresponding Riemann surface is the Klein quartic. It's a very beautiful mathematical object with 168 symmetries. It's a very beautiful object. Now, this is a subgroup of PSL2R. the group of isometries of the corresponding tessellation. No, it, it's a group of, of direct isometries. So a fundamental domain is a good remark. The fundamental domain is really made out of two symmetric copies of the, of the triangle. And then you look at PSL2R modulo this lattice, and you look at the action on the left by diagonal matrices. This is the geodesic flow on the corresponding orbifold. And what Pierre did is he found a very beautiful Birkhoff section, very easy. It is the following. You take this geodesic, oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. This is rectangular. You connect the two the vertices with the right angle by a segment. And you look at all unit vectors pointing towards this direction. So you took all this for each point here. You look at all vectors, all unit vectors, let's say with pointing up. OK, so the, the geodesic is one dimensional. It's a segment. For each point on this segment, you look at all vectors pointing towards the top of the picture. OK? Theorem. This is a torus minus one hole. And the first return map on this torus minus one hole is the famous 2111 map. So the first return map is really what I call the smale map 2111. 
the simplest example of a matrix in SL2Z with trace bigger than 2, the standard example. So the geodesic flow on the corresponding orbifold is really the same as the iteration of the matrix 2, 1, 1, 1. Anyway, so uh, Pierre is playing with these kind of games. He's constructing lots of Birkhoff sections using beautiful uh, 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 constructions. One of them is uh, if you take a triangle PQR, PQR, this is pi of P, Q, R. He looks at the so-called ortic triangle. The ortic triangle, you take the height of the triangles. As you know, even in hyperbolic geometry, the three heights intersect. This is a good exercise. And you look at this triangle. And this triangle is a closed geodesic. And this closed geodesic leads to a torus, which is transverse to the flow. And this leads to a 2 by 2 matrix. And you can understand it. And you can prove all the theorems using this kind of picture. I'm not going further. So this triangle is a closed geodesic. And then you look at all vectors, unit vectors, as before. And you get the torus. Uh, sorry, I said something wrong. This is not what you do. No, sorry, 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 sorry. You take the symmetric. You get some kind of symmetric triangle. And you fill this butterfly with convex curves, like Lemniscat curves, in the spirit of, of, uh, of Birkhoff. And you look at all unit vectors tangent to one of these circles, and you get a beautiful torus on which the first return map can be computed explicitly. That's a, a mixture of, of beautiful mathematics, I think. Yes, for PQR, you have a beautiful 2 by 2 matrix. You can understand it as a word in the generators on SL2Z, and you can understand everything. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so let me uh, uh, change uh, just a little bit topic. And let me uh, explain something related but different. This is a question that I asked uh, uh, Pierre de Hornois, another conjecture I had. But I was very happy because Pierre disproved it. So he uh, uh, indeed showed I was wrong, which is good from time to time. So here's what uh, I want to discuss. I introduced the following concept. You know, uh, Poincaré was really fascinated by the fact that any two fibers of the Hopf vibration that did not exist, but he was aware of the Hopf vibration, are linked. This is a fundamental fact of Hopf vibration. Hopf fi hop vibration, you can see that as a circle action. And any two orbits of the circle actions link. Always the same linking number, one. So I introduced a few years ago the foreign concept that I called left-handed flows. So you have a flow, phi t, on a three-manifold. Now you assume that the three-manifold is a homology sphere. Could be the three-sphere if you wish. Could be more complicated if you wish. So let me 
give a first approximation of what could be left-handed. Left-handed means, by definition, any two periodic orbits link positively. This is not a good definition because sometimes flows have no periodic orbits at all. So if a flow has no periodic at all, this condition would be satisfied trivially, and obviously you cannot do anything with that. So uh, uh, I'm going to replace this periodic orbit by invariant measure, invariant probability measure. So I will not go into the details. But if you have a probability measure which is invariant by Poincaré recurrence, almost every point is going back to its close to itself as many times as you want. So if you take a point, a typical point, it's basically like a periodic orbit up to a small mistake. So using this idea, you can define the concept of <coughs> linking number of two, of two invariant measures. You take two invariant measures. Take a typical long trajectory for the first, typical long trajectory for the second, look at the, at the linking number, go to the limit, you want this limit to be positive. So that's a pretty natural definition. <coughs> With this kind of definition, I have an equivalent definition. And the theorem is this is equivalent, is the following. You know how to compute linking number. There's a formula for it given by Gauss. Gauss taught us that you can compute the linking number by some double integral. A double integral of some differential form. You integrate over the first knot, over the second knot, you divide by 4 pi, and you get the linking number. This is the Gauss linking formula. So the theorem I proved is that this condition is satisfied if and only if there is a Gauss linking form on M which is positive on the vector field. You see, one way to have a positive linking number is to have this integral positive. One way to have an integral which is positive is that the function you integrate is positive everywhere. So one way to guarantee that two linking num two, two knots are positively linked is to guarantee that the Gauss form is everywhere positive. So if you can realize that, if you have some Gauss formula computing the linking number. If this, if this Gauss formula is everywhere positive, this is equivalent to this condition. Is omega? omega is, a, you know, have a look at the Gauss form. What is Gauss form? Maybe I should write the formula. Gauss formula. Gauss formula is this. If you want to compute the linking number of two curves in free space, let's say gamma 1 of S1 and gamma 2 of S2, you have to compute the following integral. Okay, it's a double integral. For each point S1, S2, one point on, on the first circle, another point on the second circle, you look at the determinant of three vectors. One is the tangent to the curve, 
The other one is a second tangent to the curve, and this is the vector pointing from one to the other, and you divide by the cube of the distance. You integrate this, you get the Gauss, you get the linking. This is the formula of Gauss. What is the structure of this formula? It's a two form, it's of, of, of by degree one one. It's a, it's a two form on m cross m of by degree one one outside of the diagonal and changing sign. Okay? This is what I mean. This two form, when you evaluate it on two points, you want it to be positive. Yes, of course, this is uh, difficult. This is difficult and this is obvious. This is obvious because when you have a function which is positive, if you integrate it, it's positive. This comes from the ergodic Yes, yes, it's a, it's a version. It's a very, very weak version of the ergodic theory. Yes, yes, that's not difficult. Yeah. So this is obvious, and the difficult part is this. So the, the theorem says that if you have a vector field which is left-handed, it is left-handed for good reasons. There is, there is a formula explaining it. And then I had this definition. Of course, the Hopf vibration is a good example. But a good example is that take the Hopf vibration and perturb a little bit the vector field. It is still left-handed, and it's not anymore the Hopf vibration. Okay. And I proved the following which makes, I think, this concept interesting. Theorem. If a flow is left-handed, any finite collection of periodic orbits You can choose it as you wish. Is the boundary of a section? Is the boundary of a surface S in M transverse to the flow? So if you want to understand the dynamics of a left handed flow, you give me 2,000 uh, periodic orbits. I use them as the boundary of a surface. This surface is transversal to the flow, and I look at the, I can understand the dynamic through the first return map on this section. So for left-handed vector fields, the dynamics is really reduced to two-dimensional diffeomorphisms of surfaces, just like in the geodesic flow. Is the statement clear? This is the situation we are very happy because you can forget about continuous flow, and you just reduce to discrete actions of Z. OK, you could tell me, OK, this is beautiful, beautiful, blah, 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 but do you know examples? I told you I know the Hopf vibration and all its perturbations, which already is interesting. For example, if I take the geodesic flow of a surface with constant curvature plus 1 plus epsilon, plus or minus epsilon, this is in this category. And the second example I had is uh, my favorite flow. Second example is the modular flow. If you take SL to R modulo SL to Z, you have an action of diagonal matrices on it. The geodesic flow, the famous modular flow that we all of us like, I think. And this flow is left-handed. Well, you could tell me uh, this is not a closed three manifold. And this is not a homology sphere. So how do you compute linking numbers? That would be a good question. But the good news is that this three manifold, as a three manifold, is homeomorphic to the three sphere minus the trefoil knot. So the modular flow here is actually a flow on the three sphere where you can compute linking numbers, invariant measures, blah, 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 everything you need. So the consequence is that the left-handedness here 
shows a lot of information on the nature of periodic orbits of the modular flow. And you know, modular uh, periodic orbits of the modular flow are just like uh, uh, units in quadratic fields. So they sh it shows that if you give me any collection of periodic orbits of the modular flow, they can serve as the boundary of a surface in SL2R modulo SL2Z, which is transversal to the flow and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. So I was hap I am happy with that. But of course, I asked uh, Pierre, can you generalize that to more complicated Fuchsian groups? Can you do it for 2, 3, 7? So here's the question I asked Pierre. Is the flow on PSL2R modulo gamma PQR left-handed? This is the homology sphere. Okay? This is homology sphere. And this is compact now. Okay? Is it left-handed? And the answer is yes. And this is the theorem of, of uh, again of Pierre de Hornois. What? It's uh, rational is enough. This one is even integral homology sphere, but this is uh, even better. Okay, rational is enough. So the answer is yes. Beautiful theorem. The bad point is that the proof is ugly. Using hard computing. Uh, weeks of computations on Macintosh, and uh, uh, very disappointing. So what my dream was, and is, to find this. So I said to Pierre, try to find some kind of modular form, but not a usual modular form, a form, a modular form depending on two points. That would be obviously positive on, 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 the, on the geodesic flow. Find it. I mean, probably uh, Felix Klein found it already. Or maybe you look in Jacobi, or maybe you find such a formula that gives you for free the left handedness of the geodesic flow on these uh, arithmetic examples. And he didn't find it, and I didn't find it either. But the, uh, I think the reason why he didn't find it is that maybe it does not exist. I mean, that does exist, but. <laughs> Let me tell you the bad news. The bad news is this. If you put a fourth point, the answer is no. So Pierre found examples of pairs of periodic orbits for four punctures, which link positively and, those and some others negatively. So if there were some kind of miraculous modular form that would explain this positivity, I don't see how it could explain positivity for three punctures and not explain positivity for four punctures. So maybe this yes is maybe a miracle. I have no idea. Nevertheless, uh, I'm very happy by the fact that this 237, which is one of my favorite mathematical objects, is left-handed. And I think it's, uh, it's something that maybe could be even useful in number theory. Yeah, you give me, you can, it's connecting several periodic orbits of the geodesic flow. It's like taking two units in two quadratic fields and you construct something out of, of the two. It could be useful for something. Okay, so my time is over. Let me just finish by uh, uh, asking you maybe two questions. Uh, maybe only one. Here's another conjecture that would that would give give sense to the that would explain why we find so many Birkhoff sections. The conjecture could be this: consider on a three-manifold M the set of vector fields on the three manifolds of non-singular vector fields. And in this set, you look at the subset of those having at least one Birkhoff section. One 
black cross section. So in the set of vector fields, you look at those having a black cross section. And the conjecture is maybe this is generic in the bare category sense. So you have to be careful, because as you probably know, in dynamical systems, even the existence of one periodic orbit is called the closing lemma. It is called in the C1 category. It's not known in the C2 category. So let me put C1 generic just to avoid this question of, of a periodic orbit. So Here's the question. Take a vector field, your favorite vector field, non-singular vector field. Is it possible to perturb it a little bit in such a way that the perturbed vector field has a Birkhoff section? I have no idea. OK, uh, uh, let me finish by uh, something which is unrelated, but related to Adler. Uh, I, as I told you, I learned, uh, uh, I learned yesterday that I learned long time ago, what is a Möbius band from Adler. So uh, let me uh, explain, and this is a quiz for you, uh, that I learned from uh, uh, Tadashi Tokieda. Uh, this is a very beautiful exercise about the Möbius band. The exercise is this. OK, you know that if you take a strip of paper, if you glue the two sides, you get a cylinder. If you twist, you get a Möbius band. Easy. Now suppose you take two bands, and you construct a cross like that. OK. And you construct some kind of double Möbius band. That is, you glue the two sides with a twist. OK. Now my question is, if I cut this object by the middle, what do I get? Any hint? Maybe let's begin by something easier. I do not twist. So I do not twist the two sides and I cut by the middle, what do I get? What? Well, so I, I, I could do it. And the truth is, so, so this is a trick from uh, Tadashi Tokieda. And he, he's very good for doing it in practice, but I'm very bad for that. So I have to ask you to think about it. So here's the, the answer for that. When you cut on the untwisted case, you get sure. Easy. Now twist. 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 Cut. And let me give you the answer. This is very beautiful. The answer is you get a pair of link linked hearts. You get something like that. You can do that with your fiancé if you wish. This is one. This is what you get. <laughs> this is very nice. I wish I had discovered that. This is very beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you.